Following the outbreak of war on the 11th of October 1899, Boer columns began to invade the Crown Colony of Natal from the north, and only three weeks later defeated the British garrison in the town of Ladysmith, two days later besieging that town. By this point, the entire northeastern part of the Crown Colony was under Boer control, effectively all the territory north of the Tugela River. A little to the south of the river, the officer commanding the small British garrison at the town of Escort decided on the 15th of November to send out a reconnaissance patrol on board an armoured train. Accompanying the patrol was a 24-year-old newspaper correspondent, Winston Spencer Churchill, on what was to prove, although he was unaware of it for some time, to be the first day of the rest of his life. Once again, my name is Ron Gold, and uh, this is the sixth in the series of videos that we're making here at Three Tree Hill Lodge, which will culminate in the Battle of Spienkop, which we'll get to in two or three weeks' time. Today I'm departing slightly from the timeline and looking specifically at the adventures of Winston Churchill, who would of course be present at the Battle of Spienkop. When he passed out from Sandhurst, Churchill joined the 4th Hussars, which were based in India. He did manage to get away from his regimental duties from time to time, visiting Cuba during the time of the Spanish-American War, and sending dispatches back from the United States, which made his reputation as a writer. He was becoming increasingly unpopular in certain circles with his brother officers, and one newspaper man <coughs> referred to him rather sneeringly as Pushful the Younger. He decided, however, that his career was not military, but to be politics, resigned his commission in the army, and contested the by-election in the constituency of Oldham in July of 1899. He was defeated in the by-election, and finding himself at a loose end, secured a position with the now defunct newspaper The Morning Post as a correspondent, and travelled out to South Africa on the Donata Castle, arriving on the 30th of October. He journeyed overland, catching a steamer at one point, arriving in Durban, with the intention of making his way to the British garrison in Ladysmith. Well, of course, this had been thwarted by the siege, and he finds himself in the town of Escort. And that is how he came, to be invited to accompany the armoured train on its ill-fated reconnaissance patrol on the 15th. Of November. The Boers had artfully placed rocks on and between the lines and succeeded in derailing portion of the train. And as the battle raged, Churchill, behaving with almost reckless courage, marshalled a small group of men to clear the line. He managed to do this successfully, and the remaining portion of the train, effectively just the locomotive, continued down the line to the safety of escort. Churchill was on board the locomotive, but when he realised that some of the British force had been left behind, he had the engine driver stop, he dismounted and began to walk back to see if he could help. Well, he mistimed it, and effectively he, with the rest of the British force, were rounded up by the Boers and taken prisoner, and he was packed off to a prisoner of war camp in Pretoria. However, one or two of the officers who had been on board the train, who had not been captured, on being interviewed by members of the British press on their return to escort, gave a glowing account of his conduct, of his heroism. The British press, who it admittedly had been starved of good news by this point, seized upon the good news story. They had a hero. And not only a hero, they had a name. No one really knew Winston Churchill. So might have remembered his late father, Lord Randolph. But everyone knew John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, arguably the most famous soldier Britain has ever produced. And although Churchill didn't realize it in his prisoner of war camp, his name was spread around the world. And that's all he really ever wanted. Once everyone knew who he was, the rest would become easy. Churchill was a man of unbounded zeal, and an enthusiasm, tremendous self-confidence. There was an incident where he was um, um, saying goodbye to his mother 
on his way to the war in the Sudan, where she became a little tearful and concerned, and he was quite amazed by this. And he said, Mother, it is not for the likes of I to die in these small wars. And in fact, I'll just read you his quote here. I have faith in my star that I'm intended to do something in this world. Well, his reputation now made, he will add luster to that by having celebrated his 25th um, birthday in the doubtful confines of the prisoner of war camp. A few days later, he managed to escape from the Boers. And uh, typical Churchillian uh, uh, gesture, he had become during his confinement quite friendly with the Boer Minister of War, a Portuguese citizen actually by the name of Louis de Souza. And he left on his bunk a letter addressed to the Minister of War, which I'd like to read to you. Sir, I have the honor to inform you that I do not consider that your government has any right to detain me as a military prisoner. I have decided to escape from your custody. I have every confidence in the arrangements that I have made with my friends on the outside. This, by the way, was complete nonsense. And I do not therefore expect to have another opportunity of seeing you. I therefore take this opportunity to observe that I consider your treatment of prisoners is correct and humane and that I see no grounds for complaint. Regretting that I am unable to bid you a more courteous or personal farewell, I have the honour to be, sir, your most obedient servant, Winston Churchill. I think, as we say, he is a piece of work, young Winston. That was a typical Churchillian touch, which infuriated the Boers, so much so that a telegram was now circulated as far as they could, and I'll read that to you as well. Englishman, 25 years old, about 5 foot 8 inches tall, medium build, walks with a slight stoop, pale features, reddish brown hair, almost invisible small moustache, speaks through his nose and cannot pronounce the letter S, had last a brown suit on and cannot speak one word of Dutch. While that's all true, I think one does get the feeling that the Boers were a little irritated by him. On his arrival, via Mozambique, back in Durban, he rejoins the British Army, ironically only a few hundred meters from the place where he was taken prisoner. He's presented to the British General Sir Redvers Buller and asks Buller if he could in fact rejoin the army. Buller, with some misgivings, acceded to this and Churchill will spend the rest of his time in South Africa as a lieutenant with the South African Light Horse. Um, the reason for this was to let him to get closer to the action. He will effectively still continue to behave as a newspaper man. And it is in this role as a lieutenant in the South African horse that Winston Churchill from the British command post at Mount Alice will observe the action on the Spionkop. Well, I think as we all know, observing is not really good enough for him. And the time comes when He's uh, becoming frustrated and decides to climb the hill. And during that climb up the hill, he confronted um, some of the results of that battle, the bodies of, of casualties, wounded men. And he leaves a harrowing description of this, which I will deal with in more detail when we discuss the Battle of Spionkop. He would be present later that evening when the battle was over and the officer commanding on the summit made the fateful decision to abandon the hill. But more about that later. Churchill will be present with the uh, mounted troops who would be the first of the relief column into the town of Ladysmith. And from there he would then move across to the Western Theatre where once again when British troops enter the city of Pretoria, Churchill together with his cousin the Duke of Marlborough would ride to the rescue of the very same prisoners with whom he'd been incarcerated after the armored train incident. One little known fact is during the Battle of Diamond Hill in the early days of July 18, uh, 1900 rather, he would effectively be recommended for a Victoria Cross, something he desperately wanted by the way. Things were different in those days. Officers competed openly for Victoria Crosses, but the awarding of them was often fairly political. But Churchill had got up far too many people's noses by that stage in his life. And that citation never went forward 
as a specific recommendation. Later that same month, Churchill would board once again the same ship, the Donata Castle, make his way back to England to participate in the British general election where he would be elected as a member for Oldham and, as we say, the rest was history. Sadly for us here in South Africa, he never came back to this country, but he retained fond, fond memories of it. During his maiden speech in Parliament, he spoke very sympathetically of the Boers and he urged the British not to be too harsh in any peace negotiations. During the Second World War, when he developed his um, special forces, what did he call them? He called them the Commandos. And where did he get that name? From the Boer military units that he admired so much. He developed a very close friendship with one of the Boer commanders, Jan Smuts. Jan Smuts will rise to serve in the British war cabinets in both world wars. He'll be the only foreigner ever to be appointed as a British field marshal. And the friendship between he and Churchill has been captured in a book which is well worth reading. Well, next week we'll get back onto the timeline and we will take you on um, a journey on the rest of the Boer advances into Natal and end up in the shadow of the hill of Spienkopf.